I'm Lisa Haysha and welcome to the Legacy Interviews. Today I have John Perlman. John Perlman is a plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills. Tell me he doesn't have a lot to share. <laughs> a lot of inside secrets about life, beauty, what does it all mean? And he's met extraordinary people. He's an extraordinary person. And I met him recently at a mixer of the best of LA. He won best plastic surgeon. So I'm so interested in really picking his mind. So I asked him if he would do this interview because I think who he is is so fascinating. I could never imagine being a plastic surgeon and you know taking that risk with someone's face or body. So please share with me. Tell me a little bit about your journey and how you created this life you lead. Well, it's very interesting. Thank you for that nice introduction. I am flattered. Um, life has been interesting, as I'm sure it is for anyone, but it's, it has its particular challenges, both as a professional, dealing with people. I've learned a lot, a lot about human nature, a lot about myself. But an important part of my life is also being a parent and being a friend to people who are close to me and trying to be a decent person, I think, and using good, good judgment. Uh, and having high values. But as a plastic surgeon, I, I started my route many years ago um, and decided to go into medical school. First, I thought I'd be an engineer yes. and maybe a scientist and you know, every kid was involved or interested in space. But the reality was I liked dealing with people and, and did decide to choose medical school. Fortunately, got into a few and went to a fine one in New York City. After that, it was a decision as to whether to go into uh, a cardiology or to become a, a surgeon. Of course, I chose the latter. And in time, doing surgery on the brain, doing surgery in the heart, I realized that when I was an older man, probably about 40 from that perspective, probably not like to be running into an emergency room in the middle of the night. And so I liked <clears throat> working on different parts of the body. Plastic surgery became very appealing to me. Uh, that was quite a commitment because after four years of medical school, four years of college, five years of surgical residency, I had to do another two years of plastic and reconstructive surgery. Um, that all completed about 30 years ago, and I started on the path of uh, working as a professional and, and taking the responsibility for making people feel better about themselves, getting them through illnesses, and subsequently specializing more in getting to make people feel good about who they are. Part of that is, of course, how they look and how they perceive their own body image. Right. Um, but it's been very fulfilling. Uh, my initial work was focused on burns and industrial hand injuries, and I'm proud to say I had the successful experience of reattaching a, a, a draftsman's hand one mm. time as an example. Um, um, other times, re reconstructing severe injuries to people's faces, hands, bodies, uh, and it was very gratifying. But these are people who really didn't want to be there. They were, it was forced upon them. They generally had an accident or some, some trauma. And I realized that people who feel badly about their appearance, for example, the classic bump on the nose or a girl with a long yes. nose or a large nose, their issues are as important to them and are as significant in, in their life as, as a severe burn would be to somebody who had that misfortune. So I realized that there's a lot of value in helping people to feel better about how they look. And uh, I, I actually had the interesting experience of being on a television show for a few years where they went behind the scenes and they showed the, the uh, individual person's family and their home life. And as a plastic surgeon, I rarely got to see that, but it was a way to delve into how the effects of plastic surgery changed their lives, affected their family members, generally positively, mm -hmm. not always, but generally positively. So it gave a lot of value to the experience that I had, the path that I had chosen, in, in working with patients to, to make them feel better and, and happier about themselves. So it's been very gratifying. On the side, I, I found to my surprise that I really love parenting. And I have two children, one's grown, who still lives with me and, and is working, graduated from school, and another young child who's about eight years old, going on nine. And uh, I never realized I had this, this powerful side. I almost call it maternal because I feel very right. caring and, and, and responsible for each of, uh, of them. And that's become an important part of my life. So integrating the two has been a bit of a challenge. How can you have a, an yes. active practice, have responsibility seven days a week for patients you've operated on, and yet be there for your kids? And, and so yeah. that's been an interesting challenge for me, but it seems to have worked out pretty well so far. Well, share with me a little bit about 
the fine line you must have when you're about to work on someone, you're meeting someone for the first time, and they're like, I want a nose job, and I want a boob job, and I want liposuction here and there. How do you know when to take someone or not? Is it naturally you've been doing it so long so you understand psychological signs that you're going, I'm not going to get near this person because they're going to sue me regardless of what I do, or you think it might hurt them. They want something like they might have a Barbara Streisand nose and they want you know, a tiny button nose. And you're like, no, it'll totally ruin your face. Trust me, you look good just the way you are or just the little, you know, softening. That's a very good question. How do you make that call? The fact of the matter is it's based on experience. And I think we're all naive at first. But then we learn that there are um, surprises that occur. Some people react much more favorably than you would expect them to because they were very questioning and uncertain going into the procedure yes. before they made the decision. Others uh, uh, will come in and say, I've heard you're wonderful. I know you can do this for me, and I, I worship. Uh, you're, the, you, you're the best. You're the, that's the one to watch out for, particularly. But we also have to Why judge. Why is that? Well, those are people who will easily become disappointed. Mm. They put you up on a pedestal because they expect something that may not be really possible. Um, and if they're disappointed, they, they, they shift. They, they become angered about it. So we have to be careful yes. uh, of that type of a patient. But there are also other people who really are uncertain and, and need to hear some information repeated over and over and over again uh, to allow them to make the decision that they want to move ahead themselves. And once they've made that decision, maybe by asking the question once and a second time and a third time just to hear it, they, they become comfortable with the concept or comfortable with their selection and they become very good patients. The, the people we really have to watch out for are those with uh, body dysmorphic disorder patients who you think will never be satisfied no matter what you do. And sometimes they're very difficult to pick up on during an interview. Other times I've found uh, I'll be discussing issues with uh, an individual in a one-on-one -on -one setting, and it just seems like they ask a question about this aspect of their face and another aspect of their face, and then they'll skip to their breasts and maybe their thighs and their skin. And you just have the sense that they're never going to be satisfied with themselves. And that's led me to often turn the table, basically, and start asking them questions about their background, their experience, yes. relationship with their parents, uh, uh, things that we don't normally probe into too deeply. But sometimes you can just see that, that they have issues from their, often from their childhood, maybe a, a very critical father or an alcoholic mother that they could never satisfy. And so these people just have bad self-images, and they really need therapy life coaching. They, they don't need plastic Absolutely. surgery. Absolutely. That's what I wanted to ask you, like a Heidi Montag. She became a poster child for getting so much surgery done and I, at one time. And I know you did this show, Extreme Makeover, yes. where you did that on a lot of patients. You really gave them a complete makeover, top to bottom, right? Yes, You didn't just do one often. procedure. Yes, Correct. very often. So how did that make you feel? Do you think that's the right decision? Do you think it's individual? Do you think those people are, uh, is it uh, something missing inside or do you think that does shift them? Well, I, I don't know Heidi Montag Because she said well. she regrets it. Yes. Yeah. Um, when I heard all of the procedures she had done in one session, uh, a, a red flag, a warning sign went up. I, I knew there was something wrong in the decision-making process. Now, Extreme Makeover was somewhat similar in that we were uh, offering individuals who would never have the opportunity mm -hmm. to have a lot of things done for free. And so it's hard for a patient to go, you know, I'll just think about having my nose done, but let's not worry about the liposuction. They're going to be inclined to go, give me yes. as much for free as I yes. can possibly get. So it becomes the surgeon's responsibility to make sure that it's safe because of after course. hours and hours of surgery, even on a healthy individual, the, the risks go up. So I'm proud to say that I talked to the producer at the time who was very understanding, I said, look, we're going to have a misfortune unless we are willing to offer these patients two surgical procedures separated by a couple or a mm. few weeks. And he was very responsive and receptive to that because safety is a primary issue. So I don't think we were dealing with people with body dysmorphic disorder. We were dealing with people who would never have an opportunity to get their teeth fixed and to have their eyes look better. I watched and, a couple of the episodes and it was very inspiring actually. And I was like, oh, I didn't expect this. Yeah, yeah, there were a lot of pleasant surprises, I yes, have to say. Yes, and they seemed really like normal people who just said, if I just, I never looked, I never, 
I don't look the way I feel inside and I just want my inner to match my outer. That's a typical complaint, especially mm -hmm. as people age. They go, I feel yes. like I felt when I was 30 years yes. old, but I look like I'm 65 and it doesn't sit well with me and maybe I could do better at work or do better socially or just feel more confident in myself if I look younger and look better. Those are good candidates for plastic surgery. And many people, I've, I still recall sitting in the, in the preoperative room preparing to mark a patient for surgery and have the woman in this particular case who remains a friend of mine say, you know, I've waited 31 years for this mm. procedure. In her case, it was a breast lift yes. and a breast augmentation. When you think about a 16-year-old feeling poorly about their body shape and image, how it affects them and how it affected their life and their self-confidence, and in the course of two or three hours to be able to dramatically change that, it's a very powerful tool. Absolutely. So it has to be applied selectively and carefully. And you know, sometimes we make mistakes. Okay, so let me ask you this. Yes. How do you deal with the God complex? Because you are kind of playing God in there. Well, I, I don't think do I have that issue. I'm very much aware of my own shortcomings. Yeah, you limits. do. You're very um, easy to talk to, to be with. You're very approachable. But how do you not get an ego of saying, look, I could work on brains, I could change faces, I could, you know, that's a... No, it's interesting because you do it every day. And I, and, I, and I think that there are people who perhaps get a God complex. Yeah, most, when I've talked to surgeons, they're plus, especially Egotistical. plastic, oh, very much so. Well, I, I think the majority... And they try to be intimidating to others and... See, I don't like that type of yes. personality. And I know people who are very pretentious and arrogant yes. and, uh, you know, patients sometimes leave their office crying. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not the way I like to operate. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's not uh, admirable at all. But the reality is that we all, no, no, no one's perfect, and we can help people, and it's a powerful tool. Yes. But if your ego gets command of you, then bad things are going to happen. I think so. So Absolutely. we try our best to be the, the best we can and the best individuals we can. So what obstacles have you had in life, if any? I'm sure we all have had our challenges, either in grade school or college or in your profession. Did you ever have a hard time where you had to shift things and then came out on the other side? Well, I, I don't know if this answers your question, but the biggest challenge I had, I think, was getting through a divorce. I had a five-year-old daughter, and I was kind of shocked by it, and it was, uh, and I'm a pretty stable person, but it was emotionally very um, um, uh, tumultuous. It was, there was a lot of turmoil, and it was hard to continue uh, and get through that, for, especially the first three to six months was, was very shocking to the system and um, uh, very difficult, but succeeded. My ex-wife and I are, are friends now, many years later, and work very cooperatively. So it was a good lesson that you can get through what at the time seems like a horrible, uh, unconquerable experience, um, and, and yet move on, and move on with life. The other thing that comes to mind is I was uh, walking across the street with my daughter, who was small at the time, and, and a dog, standing in rollerblades, walked out, and somebody went through a red light and hit me and broke my ankle. And uh, after about 10 days, I had to make the decision whether I was going to go back to work, mm. hopping on one foot for the next two months or not. And make a long story short, I, I made the decision to go back to work. And walking on one foot for two and a half months, 24 hours a day, uh, really taught me something, that I could even operate and I could go back and my practice was busy, that you can overcome challenges uh, of all sorts. And then anything you face in the future seems easier because mm. you've gone through yes, these, gotten through these experiences. So those are the two things that, that come to mind. I, I think otherwise I was really blessed. I had a very, very good home situation, a very loving mother, extraordinarily supportive, strongly supportive father. So that aspect of my childhood was a real lucky break for oh, me. That's why you are the way you are. Probably, yes, and, yes. Uh, at least that's a good side of me. So. Yes, a couple of plastic surgeons that I've spoken to always had a very severe father, you know, a mom that was going through issues or was being dominated by him. There was always something. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I wonder mm -hmm. if that led them to go into plastic yeah. surgery. Do you want to, I'll show you, I'll be better than you or I'll be as good as you, you know, yeah. one of those issues. So, you know, they poured into the world. <laughs> Look, I made it. I'm better than you. Yeah. See, I'm a plastic surgeon. Well, I think you find a lot of people and politicians yeah. too who are extraordinarily driven yes. and, and businessmen. Actors. A uh, yeah. Yes, actors Writers, too. Writers, producers. Who find incredible success. Yes. But are they happy is the other Most question. Most of them aren't because they didn't do the inner work. They're so focused on outer, you know, responses to them, fame and being glorified 
that they forget to go inward. And that's why so many of them do drugs and commit suicide, even at top of their game. And we hear a lot about that. But someone like you, who knew what he wanted to do relatively young, um, what do you have to say for other people who don't have a vision or maybe didn't have the blessing of a childhood like yours, who's struggling, who's 20-something or in college or not in college, saying, I have no clue what to do with my life and I don't know how to figure that out? Well, I'm not sure I have the answer, but the truth of the matter is you have to be in the game. You have to be out there. And, and I think it's important, and one thing that's really helped me a lot is, to, and it sounds silly, but to have a positive outlook. Even when the odds seem to be stacked against you, be cheerful. Be optimistic and positive because I think that that, I hate to say vibe, but that vibe brings good things to you, brings opportunities. So rather than be downtrodden and let it get the best of you and, and kind of go along with that negative scenario, I think it really helps to what I call have contrarian thinking. Everything looks bleak and mm. there's no cl clear answer. I'm going to flip a switch. And, and I like to think about what the ideal guy in my situation, how he would deal with a problem. And I respect that person because he seems to handle things better than I naturally would, so I'll try to emulate that person. And, and I find that that helps. So I think that the two ideas of, of trying to be the best person you can, but also you know, making sure you're in the game, be out there with a positive outlook and disposition, good things tend to come to you. Yes, and doing positive things instead of sitting home crying or doing drugs Absolutely. or watching you know, shoot up movie after shoot up movie and blowing up movies and watching the news. Right. Do something for other people. Get out there, be of service, volunteer. Great then you'll examples. start meeting people and people start saying, oh, I know this guy if you want to get a job and... Right. I, and I think that's good advice. Showing up. And the problem up. is it's hard to say, well, if you do that for two weeks, your, your, your opportunities will, mm -hmm. will be available. It may take two years, but at but least if you're getting out there getting and slowly there. that'll shift your consciousness, you'll right. see a different world. You're not going to just see a world of your inner world, which is dark. Yeah, there are opportunities out there, but There's they're not going to throw themselves at you. No. I think you have to connect with people and through people and, and put out a good sense or a good vibe, and those opportunities will hopefully uh, come to you. Yeah, and that's a muscle. You have to work that muscle. That's right. You know, you can't just sit here and think about it. It takes effort to get up there the first time or the second time. You're like, I'd rather stay home than go and yeah. help in a school or read to the elderly or do whatever it is you do. But well, haven't we all seen somebody who's in the same boat but has yes. a, just that great outlook and great attitude about yes. solving problems? We have to emulate them. It may not be the way you think inside internally, but I think you can learn from copying people who are successful. That kind of an attitude, be positive with people. I mean, I, it sounds silly, but I think we should all make an effort at least once or twice a day driving around Los Angeles yes. to go out of our way to be kind to somebody else. Let them in the lane. They'll do it to somebody else. It just gives a, a, a good vibe and uh, makes, makes people feel better about life. Yeah. I have a girlfriend who carries a backpack filled with like little basic necessities and some cookies and stuff like that. And when she's feeling down, she goes and delivers these backpacks to people. Yeah, good homeless. idea. And it's just so sweet. It's like, you do what? Yeah. <laughs> she goes, yeah, I was super depressed and crying. So I put together more backpacks and went out there and just spent the day giving these backpacks out and talking to homeless people. And like, oh my God, that Another is so amazing. The thing that's amazing. nice is to stop and help the elderly. I mean, yes, you see absolutely. Elderly it's people things. don't expect people to be friendly to them. Yes. And you know, their affects are somewhat subdued. If you see an elderly person, you go out of your way to ask them, how are you today? I hope you're having a good day. A big, bright smile breaks out on their face. Yes. Makes them feel good, makes you feel good. Doesn't cost anything. It's something yes. that we should all be doing. So what are some parenting tips? How are you raising your uh, son? Two kids. Yeah. Well, I, I think the most important thing is to let them know you love them. Let them know that you're there for them, you support them, but that's not a, a free ride to do anything they want. So they have a sense of responsibility in exchange for knowing that you as a parent will always be there and supporting them, but guiding them. And uh, I've found that uh, it's, you know, the, the child parenting relationship to me is the most ideal I've found. Mm. I've had relationships, they're tough. Adults with adults, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I haven't had total success on that yeah. one. <laughs> and I don't know too many people have, but a few have. But the parent-child bond is so, uh, un unbreakable. It's, it's such a strong, simple relationship of trust and love 
um, that it's, it's, it's unsurpassed. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's just the best. It's the biggest part of my life. And, and I never expected it because my dad spoiled me as an only child. I just thought it would skip a generation. But, but I, I find that I think I've, I've equaled my, my father's love for me in giving love to my children. And, and I found that to be extremely satisfying and gratifying. Mm. So what do you want your legacy to be? Wow. I, I think my legacy is going to be that I was a, a decent person, an honest person, uh, a loving and, and giving person. And it's as simple as that. Worked hard, tried to play as much as possible, but was there for my friends and my kids. And you shifted many lives with your profession. Some truth to that. Yes, yes. It's very satisfying too. Absolutely. We all try to do that. You yes, do we all do. We all do try. And some need to try a little harder, I guess. It's, you know, it's challenging. So I think what you just shared with us today is great advice to help people who are feeling, I don't have anything to give or, you know, I want to do something or they're, they don't know how to get out of that slump. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. It can make but you feel you. better. You do it for yourself, you, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, and it's all about love, you know. Give love, give love, and love will come back. So. Lisa, thank you so much for thank having you. me here. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much.